Hello, everybody. Welcome to the newest episode of our podcast, uh, Data Science with Dr. Shahid and Dr. Bronte. In this episode, we are hosting uh, one of my dear friends, Dr. Babak Rasulzadeh. He has been working in Silicon Valley for well over 10 years uh, in different capacities. And currently, he is a VP of Radiology in Tempest Company, uh, a precision medicine. Um, company. We talk about various topics related to AI, future of AI, ML, currently the, the situation right now and uh, how a young person can enter this field and survive in this field. Uh, it was a really nice discussion. At some point it went really philosophical. I really enjoyed the talk. I hope you enjoyed too. And also subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, because the new exciting Episodes are coming and you don't want to miss that. Hi, Babak Khan. How are you? Good, thanks. How are you? Welcome to our podcast. And uh, so just before we, we, we continue, maybe most people that uh, used to listen to our podcast realize why we are speaking English. Uh, the thing is that uh, Bobak uh, uh, grew up in Sweden, so especially when we are talking about technical stuff, I think it's much easier for everybody to, uh, instead of 20% uh, only verbs in, in, in Persian and 80% English, we just uh, continue in English. I will put a uh, uh, Farsi subtitle on, uh, on the video. The people actually listening in a podcast, the, uh, the audio one, well, yeah, I, I think uh, that's that's what it is. <laughs> okay, not do anything. <laughs> they just have that. to learn English. Yes. Yo, shad. Okay. Dafe dige man say konam be Farsi. Tamam in sohbat aro. Anjam. Mar ma khodam ma khodam ki Farsi sohbat mikonam yu mekdar. Vakti mirese technical ki mishe hamash hami hami technical ki mishe hamash English ki shat. Okay. Okay. So again, welcome to our podcast, and um, I'm really happy to have you here. Uh, as somebody who worked a lot in in, in technology and particular machine learning um, in industry. So can you just introduce yourself uh, briefly for our uh, listeners here? Sure. Um, thank you for having me. Um, looking forward to this. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I've been a fan of your podcast since I learned about it. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> so my name is Bobak Rasulzadeh. Uh, as Ali said, I, I grew up in Sweden. I'm currently the vice president of radiology, uh, or radiology AI, at a company called Tempest. Uh, Tempest is a large multinational um, biotech oncology research company. Um, we uh, call ourselves uh, world's first uh, precision medicine company, where the idea is that we uh, make healthcare, especially oncology, so cancer care, uh, better through customization based on data. So your data and uh, a lot of uh, machine learning that happens on data from others uh, to make uh, care, patient care and treatment uh, more accurate and better. So, so that's where I work now. Um, prior to that, I was uh, on um, basically in a startup where we were doing machine learning or computer vision for medical imaging, especially for uh, uh, oncology, uh, so cancer detection in all kinds of radiology images, so, so X-rays, CTs, MRs. Um, and uh, I did that for four years. I, I started there four years ago as uh, head of machine learning, but eventually became director of uh, machine learning and product, and eventually vice president of product and uh, engineering, including machine learning engineering. Um, as, as you said, Ali, I have uh, been uh, in, the, in the industry for the past 15 years. I got my PhD from Sweden uh, about, uh, what is it now? 
14 years ago, 13, 14 years ago uh, in, uh, in machine learning, computer vision. I did my PhD in um, uh, com uh, machine, uh, sorry, robotic vision. So, so humanoid robots. During my PhD, I worked on everything from um, self-driving cars. Uh, I was in Australia doing research on self-driving cars for a year. Worked on everything from pedestrian detection to kangaroo detection. We're working on in, in that in that project because it's a lot specific of specific geographic reason. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very. I think very they have specific. lots of. Uh, I heard actually that that uh, there, are, there are lots of accidents. Yes, with, yes, with no, no, uh, Probably that's the reason that they had. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Like, uh, yeah, we had to for that project. We had to have kangaroo detection just as much as pedestrian detection because there were, of course, more accidents with kangaroos than anything else. Yeah. Uh, and so, they kind of <laughs> look like human when they, yes, when they stand in the, on two legs. Yes. Especially you can when, use transfer learning. <laughs> especially in the dark when you don't actually uh, see them. So you use heat cameras. You just get this yeah. blob that sort of looks like a human, could be a human, could be a kangaroo. Oh, yeah. that would be funny. Yeah. <laughs> So I worked on everything uh, related to that, but also uh, during my PhD, I worked on humanoid robot, robotic grasping. So everything from vision to object action interaction. Um, after my PhD, I started my first startup where we were working on face recognition and object detection and images and image classification. Worked on trying to build a system that made uh, image moderation online. So sites that needed their images to be vetted or moderated, they would use our technology. So such as dating, online dating websites and other social websites um, where user generated content got uploaded. So I worked on that and after five years sold that startup to uh, an American company. That's how I ended up in America mm -hmm. uh, in, in San Francisco. Um, company called Meltwater acquired my startup. And um, at my startup, I was the CTO co-founder. At Meltwater, I became the director of data science and and, and uh, that entailed everything from computer vision to machine learning and natural language processing. And in fact, for the three and a half years I was at Meltwater, leading the data science team, I worked I would say 90%, 95% on natural language processing, so NLP. Mm -hmm. So uh, you could say I almost earned a second PhD in, in just NLP during <laughs> those years. Uh, and then even after that, I worked for two years at a company together with Ali, yep. a protagonist, yes. where we continued working on um, computational linguistics and yeah. uh, things related to uh, NLP and, and beyond. Uh, since then, yeah, I've been... Uh, Co-founder co of, investor in, advisor for uh, half a dozen or so startups. Um, and I would say the red thread, the, the common theme has always been machine learning, computer vision, natural language processing, um, those kind of topics. Um, but it's only in the past four, four and a half years that I've uh, dwelled into uh, medical imaging. So application okay. of... Uh, machine learning to uh, and computer vision to the medical field. Now at, at Tempest, we actually go beyond just computer vision. It's more than just visual. We we analyze genomics data, um, blood uh, test results, um, um, car cardiology data, so EKGs, for instance. We, we have ways of predicting if someone's going to die six months from now purely based on their EKG from their heart, for instance. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so yeah, the machine learning um, goes beyond just computer vision. Um, yeah, in, in as the, you said, the, the precision process. medicine, which is, Correct. and you want to do precision medicine, you need to have lots of information from different formats yeah. of data, which is kind of interesting because then it's not uh, just uh, the computer vision or natural language processing or like a tabular data. You have all of them and you have to just make Indeed. models that uh, as an input, it has all these formats and you just yeah. like, feed them then and then just get it out. But but there is one thing that uh, kind of uh, interests me is that, um, uh, well, whenever we get to the kind of secrets, like uh, uh, secret sauces that you cannot say, just let me know. But 
Sure, um, sure. Uh, whenever we talk about their precision or mm -hmm. uh, talking about um, uh, really specialized solution for a really small group of people or like a one or two people, like, like even a personalization even. Yeah. One of the things that comes to mind is that how do you train that? Because if you want to train for, if you want to really specialize and uh, like uh, train something, because uh, let, let me give you some background that I had mm -hmm. like before. So one of the startups that I was working, we were trying to uh, kind of personalize the behavior of a um, certain model that we had for the mm -hmm. certain, but with the information that that person had. One, one thing that we did, we just took like a typical like NLP models. Mm -hmm. And let's say you want to make a, um, make a generative text model that uh, speaks like me. Mm -hmm. yeah? uh, of course, the baseline is whatever, uh, like this LLM that we have now, like chat, chat, chat GPT, and you may have to put something on top of it. Is it, is, it, is it what you do? It means that you take a base model and then extra train it on how I talk and then put it together like that. So something like that yeah. is happening also in the precision medicine is the same or? That's a, that's a great question. Um, I would say that is the holy grail of precision mm -hmm. medicine. Uh, that's where we want to go, of course, at Tempest. Um, but no, I mean, I would say 99% of what we and everyone else, not that there's that many, but others that are in precision medicine are trying to do is just to see at the level of what's common for humans. Cause here's the thing, medicine today, even the non-personalized one, the, the generic one is so, um, ancient so mm -hmm. medieval as we said yep. that it doesn't it doesn't take much to to go beyond that in the sense that it's not even data driven it's anecdotal a lot of mm -hmm. uh you know treatments and and um that di from diagnosis to to treatments to follow up is done based on guidelines i mean most of it is done based on guidelines and, and where do these guidelines come from? Well, these guidelines come from boards of senior doctors. I mean, by all means, these are extremely smart people, much smarter than, than you or me. Um, and are, you know, they have a lifetime experience in, in medicine and they understand the human anatomy and, and human physiology better than uh, most humans. And and uh, they're experienced physicians, experienced doctors. Um, and they sit on these boards and they look at research. Uh, they look at the body of research. We know the expertise we have in a certain field, and then they make decisions on guidelines. And then these guidelines become generic sort of rules that all other doctors uh, in, in the country or in the world will follow. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, even though these people are geniuses, Genius is no match for data. And uh, that's sort of one of my, my principles in, in machine learning and data science. Uh, I don't care how, how you can be a Nobel Prize winning genius. Um, if data says otherwise, your recommendation is shit. If the mm -hmm. data contradicts you. So um, this kind of more empirical um, uh, data driven approach is preferable because a lot of the times those guidelines might be outdated. Um, as a matter of fact, humans, uh, the typical human physiology and, and you know, the kind of foreign um, entities we, our bodies have to fight is very different today than 40, 50 years ago when these doctors became doctors. Like yep. the, the fact that the kind of challenges in the environment that a human body have today is very different than what it was 40 years ago. That already tells you that, no, you know, these guidelines and, and, and recommendations are already outdated. So, so just by making it data-driven, not even customized yet, just by making data-driven, you can actually accomplish much more already.
-hmm. But we, we, we take it, and that's our vision, to take it one step further than that even. Uh, so, sure, most of our models are just trained models on large population, modern population of humans. Um, but, uh, and, and they're purely data-driven. And often we do see disagreement with guidelines. We see that oh, what our model recommends or what our model predicts is different from what the guideline recommends mm -hmm. or predicts given certain symptoms. Um, so we already know that uh, we can uh, perform better. But yes, by just adding a little bit of fine tuning there, which would be the customization, which would be what you're talking about, which is to take that model, now add, fine tune that model with my personal data. Mm -hmm. You can do it by means of incremental learning. You can do it by means of um, uh, transfer learning. Uh, all of these techniques we're familiar with from machine learning. And, uh, and you can accomplish even better res results. Yeah. 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 And the other thing that I was, uh, I was thinking, actually, uh, based on um, my own experience, because uh, what I was experiencing, uh, when you're young, you don't notice this kind of thing. Because as a, this one comedian was saying that when you're under 30, you're visiting to a doctor yearly uh, checkup. It's like a drive through You just go in. You don't even close the door. The guy just like take you and go out. Yeah. Yep. That's it. Everything is fine. But when you get like around 40, when you get, then uh, the, that comedian was saying that you go inside the, the doctor's office and then the, the doctor said that, uh, Please close the door behind you. <laughs> <laughs> we have things to do. Yeah, we have so, some some things to talk. Yeah, serious talk about this stuff. But so what I'm trying to say is that when you get to this age, you realize that when you go to the doctor, and uh, the doctor just even simple as measuring your temperature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you go there, and normally it should be around like a, what is that? Like 37 centigrade or 90 something that is it 98 or something yeah uh, but but then the, that number is is a it's not exactly it's an average thing that mm -hmm. some guy measured 100 years ago yeah and then put it on the curve and then say okay this is the average yeah you maybe your normal temperature is not exactly 37 maybe you're correct. 38 correct yeah so uh when and not only I mean, that, uh, you know, he's measuring one temperature at a one data point, your ear. Or exactly. Somewhere. Like uh, in one year, like, you, you, like imagine that the whole year you do whatever you want. One data point. <laughs> you get sick, you go to the doctor and then that one data point. So I was, uh, yeah. the, I was thinking that um, this um, having devices that you can mm -hmm. have. Uh, so I, I mean, like, like my ring I here. Wanted, it, yeah. it doesn't mean I'm married or anything. It's, this is a... Yeah. Uh, this is an aura ring. It has sensors oh, yeah, yeah. that I've, measure I've heard my about it. yeah yeah that measure my my um, uh, let's see blood oxygenation, my heart rate, my um, uh, it counts my activities, so steps and things I take yeah. during the day, and a few other things. Um, it measures my sleep as well um, by movement. So yeah, I think these kind of devices are key to that kind of future that you're describing, and and. Arguably, a lot of people are starting to have some sort of personal device that measures their activity. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think that's, that's going to be very important. But I think, imagine how annoying it will be. You, you go to a doctor and then the, do the, the, the doctor said, okay, so let's have a checkup. And so I'm like, wait, wait, wait. And open your, la your laptop and they say, okay, this is all my data the last three months. This is yeah. my temperature. This is my uh, blood pressure. Well, this is my stuff. Well, now tell why, me what's wrong with me. <laughs> yeah, and, and no human doctor can do that today. Yeah, um, yeah there's lots of data. They, they will just... need tools for that. And, and that's you know the kind of tools that only we with machine learning can build. Um, and and, and, and uh, by no means am I saying that you know replace the doctors with machine learning because um, even though there's a future scenario in which that happens in some form. Uh, I do think for a foreseeable future, um, probably still during our lifetime, doctors of various kinds of doctors will still be around, but their job is going to change. Their job is going to change very dramatically. It's already changing, but it will change very dramatically in the next five to 10 years. I predict yeah. that. This is exactly the, the the next topic that I just wanted to talk about was replacing because when this chat GPT came in, 
Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they publish it and everybody was saying that, oh, these guys are like, a, if you are, a, I don't know, if you are in marketing, you're out. Or if you are like a copywriter, you're, you're right, yeah. you're just out of the business. But uh, what I believe that, particularly in, in cases like uh, physicians, is really mm -hmm. important this. Um, I'm pretty sure I'm not a physician, but if physician is like any other job, 90% of days that you are going to work, you are dealing with really mundane cases. Indeed. It means that you just go there every day, somebody comes with flu, somebody comes with like a bacterial infection, and then 10% of cases, it's just really, really for them, not for the patient, really exciting cases. It means that yeah. something comes in that you just say, oh damn, this is like a whole life. I'm waiting for this to, yeah. to learn. So, something about it. But currently, what happens is that because they spend uh, the equal amount of time are all these cases, because when there is a really, really special case comes in, they you don't have enough it. time to deal with that. Yeah, because they might miss you have. It. Yeah. Or, or, or they might just miss some signals, some symptoms that would differentiate this case from a typical flu case. Like, yeah, wait, 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 exactly. something is different here. And, and that's very hard. I mean, uh, it's it's a human uh, it's a human trait. I think it's even called a cognitive bias. There's a name for it. Where you're you're used to a certain pattern, and because of that, when there's a, um, a break or or um, exception from that pattern, you might miss the exception because you're just so used to it. Mm -hmm. uh, especially if the exception is tiny and, and not very visible. I mean, um, in a way, doctors, uh, doctors that um, are, say, specialists and maybe have more chances of seeing uh, a little bit more of the outliers and the extreme cases have better likelihood or probability of catching these mm -hmm. exceptions than, uh, for instance, general physician, uh, a GP. Yeah. And and if they use these kind of um, uh, these machines, these, uh, yeah. these algorithms, what happens is that then they can go through these ninety percent of like average cases that like they can they can go through it really fast, and then they have lots of time to spend actually on really. And this is the same thing for like if you are a copywriter or if yeah. you are a marketing person. Now, if you are a marketing person. There is a huge amount of time you're spending on emailing people, uh, writing a proper, like a PR, for example, <laughs> like if you're a PR yeah. person, like, and then if something that actually writes these boring things for you, then your brain power is kind of more to kind of finding interesting ways to market your stuff, like uh, working to yeah. like more uh, kind of, um, um, ingenious ways to yeah. work not the thing just this humans thing. are so, good at exactly yeah um you know i think well so in machine learning we have uh, you know the concept of um so false positives and false negatives and, and true positives and true negatives um or precision recall is another way of looking at it mm -hmm. now in medicine in healthcare um depending on the scenario uh one of those errors so a false positive or versus a false negative can cost have a tremendously bigger cost than the other one. So, for instance, if you miss that someone has cancer, mm -hmm. that has huge implications. So, so a false uh, negative, meaning cancer mm -hmm. not detected, can be very dangerous. So, what you do then, and and as we all of us who work with machine learning know, you for any type of detector or classifier, you can have an operating point that you set. Yep. And the operating point decides what kind of trade-off you have between you know, the two types of error, uh, precision and recall, uh, another way. Uh, and, and by having this freedom of choosing, of course, you want to set it in such a way that you absolutely you know, don't have one type of error. Again, it can be different. In some cases, actually, it's much more detrimental to have a false positive. So, so you kind of want to avoid that in other cases. But anyways, um, so you, you, you set the operating point in such a way that you can almost guarantee, at least better than a human, 
right? Mm -hmm. And we can talk more about this, like the benchmarking of these algorithms, let's say in radiology, compared to a human radiologist. For most of them, most of the uh, tasks, we have seen that we can create AI that's better than the average human radiologist. Uh, but anyway, so, so you can set in such a way that you can almost guarantee at the level of a human, guarantee that you won't have, for instance, false negatives or you won't have uh, false positives. And that means that, okay, you can actually filter out a huge amount of cases that automatically, no, no human yep. would need to look at it. True. And you only save the ones where it's like, wait, something is off here. It actually believes there's some, something here. So, for instance, all of the cases that are non-cancer, you know, it removes whatever, 90% of the work for the human radiologist. And then when the human radiologist comes into work the next day, he, he or she just looks at the positive cases. So it's suddenly 90% reduction of their workload, which means they can spend 10 times more time on those 10% and be much more accurate and much more thoughtful much more, um, you know, pay more attention and, and by doing that, give better healthcare. Yeah. More of the cost actually goes to really complicated cases. Like uh, imagine that if you have to look at a hundred pictures mm -hmm. a day, then uh, if you reduce it to like 10, then you have like 10 times more, well, not yeah. exactly 10 times, right? but exactly like uh, almost 10 times. Uh, yeah. kind of uh, more uh, time to spend on that. Yeah, yeah. you but, either you, you either yeah. spend th that time on, on each case or you spend time on getting more cases. So so each yeah. ra true. radiologist, for instance, has higher capacity. He can yeah. treat more patients. Yeah. Now, one question comes up here because uh, when you were, when you were ta talking, it just like automatically I went, uh, my mind went toward the uh, driverless cars. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's one issue that raised uh, during this Tesla stuff, particularly, that um, whenever a Tesla has an accident, yeah, there is a huge news everywhere. Yeah, of course. Yeah? And, uh, but then one of the kind of, uh, uh, I can't say, not excuses, but some, uh, some uh, argument that some people say is that, that even uh, Tesla right now with the situation, with the kind of situation of the algorithm that they have and stuff, they are kind of better than, in many cases, better than a human driver. In some cases, they have like corner cases that happens, but when a, when a human has an accident, which is a lot, I mean, if you look at the uh, like not, not number of, of course, we can always say that the number of human drivers are much more than number of uh, Teslas that like yeah. go driverless, but still people have like crazy accidents. Like they are getting drunk and then they have accident stuff. But then when, when the computer makes a mistake, then it's a news. Yeah. Yes. Of course. Now, now yeah. this is the kind of a dilemma here that imagine that if a, radio a, a radiologist actually make a mistake. Yeah. But, uh, this, this guy has cancer. He, he missed it. And it's, Kind of, they treat it as a okay human mistake. It's a human error. It happened. But then, if it turns out that that particular case was a algorithm problem, then it's the news in CNN. Yes. Yeah? Of course. So, so how how should we kind of uh, uh, train ourselves actually as a human race to mm -hmm. kind of a uh, it's I I know it's a really difficult problem. Is I think going borderline I, philosophical. I think because, I think it is yeah. philosophical. I actually yeah. think it is philosophical. Um, you know, uh, it goes back to even you know the famous trolley problem in, in yeah. philosophy, right? Yeah. So do you save one person or do do you save three persons by killing three? Sorry, do you save three persons by killing one or do you um, do you not do anything? and let uh, three people die. So here's my take on it. Um, I think it is wise or um, healthy to uh, be careful with uh, how we adopt these type of technologies. 
Um, just like you would be skeptical to a new, say, alien species that comes to Earth, and they're hyper intelligent, right? Um, and um, I know AI is not an alien species; it doesn't have, you know, a, a mission or some uh, motivation behind, you know, what it does. It's just a piece of technology. But for the sake of the philosophical sort of thought problem, if you would think of it as an alien species, you would also ask yourself, okay, these, they come here and they have, they're hyper intelligent. Do we automatically just trust them at the same level we trust a human? No. Initially, because something is new, someone is new, something is new, you have a higher level of distrust than you would if for its human counterpart. So I, I think I've thought a lot about this. Initially, I, I was, as a technologist, I was very annoyed with how the AI was treated unfairly and it wasn't benchmarked against like, you know, there would be one accident when in fact, one accident per year, for instance, with the Tesla autopilot, when in fact humans have so much more uh, on average, humans are much worse drivers, for instance. Uh, well, yes, but we, we've kind of, it's a cultural philosophical thing. We've, we've accepted that humans are part of us because we're all human. AI, we haven't yet accepted as an integral part of our society and norms and, and culture. Um, it, it's starting to get there. And I think, you know, things like chat GPT or AI being used in everyday sort of light, nothing dangerous manner is going to have a generational impact. So a generation or two from now, maybe our kids or grandkids we'll look at AI the same way we look at other humans. It's like, well, you know, just compare apples to apples. And if it's better, it's better. It doesn't matter if it makes mistake because it makes mistakes less often than humans. But today we're not there. And today I think it is fair that we are skeptical and we judge the AI much harsher. You know, sure, out of uh, a million hours of driving, humans have whatever, I'm, I'm making numbers up. 50 accidents, but AI has one accident, we still get scared about the AI. And that's fair because of the cultural issues here. Uh, yeah. But I that's it's going a, to change. It's a I see that change. Trust. I think uh, the, the, the reason that uh, it's kind of affect us is the broken trust. Mm -hmm. It's like, uh, uh, it's the same thing happens. Like, uh, imagine that uh, what's the equivalent of um, um, broken trust in the in auto industry, do you remember there was a time that there was Toyota problem? Yes. That uh, is suddenly accelerating the car, you know, and there was an accident. Yeah. So whenever you trust something fully, I always tell <laughs> tell my wife and everybody else that the fact that uh, we know that this car that we built, uh, that we are driving to work and come back, this car that that we have is built by human. Yeah. But then. We get into this car, mechanical thing that can break any time, and then we mm -hmm. just go like eighty miles per hour. I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's, why, not, it's, you it's you crazy. You can even think of an even more crazy example: airplanes. Yeah, we get them. Yeah. I mean, I used to think that maybe this has to do with understanding. Once we understand something fully, we're no longer afraid of it, and uh, and you know, this cultural acceptance, this trust is established. But I've changed my mind. I mean, I'm a, I'm a pilot since six, seven years, a pilot for, for fun, uh, not for, for job, for work. And I fly planes uh, occasionally. And I can tell you while, while I was going through my pilot training and getting the pilot license, I realized that, oh, all of the things I thought I understood about airplanes and flying were completely wrong. Uh, from aerodynamics to how actually airplanes function, how they work, the mechanics of it. Because you have to learn a lot of that in order to even pass uh, and get your pilot's uh, license. So I realized that maybe it has nothing to do with understanding, but the, um, the illusion of understanding. So once we think we understand something, trust is established. It doesn't have to be real understanding. We, we just have to... Uh, have this illusion of, of understanding. And we, we don't, we have that airplane for airplanes today. We have definitely have that for cars today. I mean, even cars, I would say most people don't understand how cars work. Most people don't understand how, especially you know, new uh, cars. Uh, 
Yeah, especially new guys. <laughs> new but even old guys, most people don't understand how a four-stroke engine works, right? Or yeah. um, combustion engines work. So uh, especially electric ones, like absolutely most people don't understand. But because it's been around so long, because of a lot of cultural, let's call it collateral around it, we we think we, we have this illusion of understanding. Yeah. But with AI, we don't even have the illusion of understanding. Yeah. In fact, we I would even say we have the illusion of not understanding. There's this mysterious black box for most people. And then and then those who understand it are very few. I mean, I would say even amongst machine learning engineers and scientists that I've met, majority don't understand it. I I don't know if even I can claim that I fully understand it all the time. Uh, but Yeah, as this happened, it's it's I'm Okay, here we go. Okay, here we go. Okay, so he had a, he has a, I will edit this part out, don't worry. No problem. No problem. <laughs> yeah. I, I had, uh, he had this piano class and okay, uh, nice. the teacher called and then his phone needed authentication with my app. Oh, of course. That's weird. <laughs> okay. So, so yeah, uh, where was I? Um, yeah, trust. So in, in summary, trust is something that's called culturally established through the illusion mm -hmm. of understanding. And and as I was saying, even I don't think I fully understand uh, how modern AI, meaning modern deep learning works. Uh, I've read the papers, but, you know, last time I fully, truly understood something, you know, thoroughly was back during my PhD when I read papers and I wrote papers myself. Uh, but that was pre-deep learning era. It was in the era of support vector machines and feature engineering. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I think I think uh, most people, in fact, have the uh, illusion of not understanding AI, uh, and and rightfully so. I mean, most people don't understand it, and therefore there's no trust yet. So yeah. give it another, you know, I don't know, decade or two. Um, and this illusion of trust, uh, sorry, illusion of understanding will start to, you know, I, I, I call it the Dunning-Kruger effect. Once most people go through the Dunning-Kruger, they, Kruger, understand, it. they, th they <laughs> understand enough to think that they understand it, this illusion of trust starts emerging. Yeah. Um, and, um, and yeah, and, and one, once that's there, I think we will start being riskier as a society. Mm -hmm. We'll start taking more risks and um and and you know that's good and bad uh, yeah and, and the other the other aspect that i was thinking about is that uh i'm compared to kids when they grow up mm -hmm. so uh uh i think ai now in general i don't like term of ai is more kind of machine learning but anyway that that uh, that machine learning now it's in the it's just past the infancy now yep. it's in uh, kind of in in the same that uh, in an age that it's going to like primary school that uh, you should trust but verify. It means that mm -hmm. when you when you have a, like a primary school kid, you you ask, okay, did you do your homework? And and they say yes. And so can I check it? You know. But when uh, gradually, as you said, ten twenty years when that AI <laughs> machine learning went to a college. Mm -hmm. and start doing that you don't say that oh let me check it no and then when that particular per like ai went and become a physician uh when you and you say okay you have this oh can somebody else check it too no <laughs> it's a physician yeah. of course you get second opinion but uh, so now i think ai is in in that age like yeah when you do chat gpt like because i i told you like before we start uh, i start writing some um, kind of uh, this article using chat gpt but uh, I don't just copy paste that. 
I just don't put it there as myself. So what I do is I check because honestly, there are lots of funny mistakes. Like I, I yeah. just write, uh, I just write, uh, I remember like one of the cases that I had, I was writing that, uh, okay, explain this in what, what you do when you do want to do Python with something anyway. <laughs> and I realized that some of the command line CLIs that he's using is using Windows. <laughs> instead of instead, like some of them were um, actually um, correct, like most of them were, were, were correct that for Ubuntu, but then some of them just like randomly were there for uh, for for Windows, so it's not yeah. working. So I had to just go back and say, oh, by the way, fix this one. So yeah. um, until we get to the point that at like I mean the, the same thing was that I remember that when I was getting my PhD, everybody hated words. Microsoft words, of course, yeah, because it was so unpredictable. So what you were doing, you put a picture there, just jumping there, and then you change yeah. something, and then everybody using LaTeX because LaTeX, it was yeah. much easier. But nowadays, I mean, yeah. everybody uses words because of now course. it's just like there is no big problem anymore, no. <laughs> and it's it's faster to use word. Yeah, LaTeX so it's a, I think it's a kind of thing that you're right. Uh, there, it takes time. It, it needs some maturity from um, um, uh, from from people, first of all, to understand yeah. that can they can trust it. Yeah. And uh, I'm and like I, again, I'm pretty sure when the traffic light came in, the first uh, <laughs> you just put it there. Uh, there were lots of confusion. That's a good example. That's a good yeah, example. Like <laughs> there were lots yeah, of and, confusion, but now look, people get used to it. I I think so. Some philosophers of futurism, they say that human beings um, think uh, linearly, which means they underestimate, uh, sorry, they overestimate in the short term and underestimate in the long term because progress is not linear, it's exponential. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's a nice graph that shows this. Um, maybe you can put it for your viewers with the linear cutting through the exponential. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, I I agree with that, but I also think it's even more extreme than that. Human beings are, uh, as a society, if you look at just technological progress and, and acceptance of, of progress, human beings are uh, skeptical, 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 and suddenly they are very accepting. And this, again, has to do with that illusion of understanding and the Dunning-Kruger effect. At some point, there's a tipping point as a society, because as individuals, it might be gradual, but as a society, it actually happens. Uh, this is what's a little bit counterintuitive. As a society, it actually happens like a delta function. Suddenly it switches because yep. it reaches a tipping point. Um, and it has to do with how democracy works and how human societies are organized that, you know, we typically need a certain percentage of people to voters or, 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 or uh, citizens to be on board with something, a, a change for it to go through. And because that happens gradual, at some point, suddenly it tips and suddenly something is accepted. And usually, usually that point is earlier than it should be. Meaning, so technology progress is exponential, sure. And um, we, 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 accept, we don't accept things for a long time. We don't accept them. And then suddenly we accept it as a step function. But mm -hmm. that's also a little bit too too early. Meaning um, uh, maybe in some cases, the technology should have benefited or would have benefited from being a little bit more uh, in the cautious stage. So yeah. that's what I meant when I said, you know, for it's good and bad that we will one day accept it because it will probably still have mistakes and errors. But as a society, we kind of make these trade-offs and we decide, okay, we're going to accept this, but we will still, that doesn't mean it's perfect. We will still face errors and catastrophes and, and things that will go wrong. I mean, look at nuclear power. Today, nuclear uh, meaning fission, not fusion. Fission is um, in most nuclear power plants. Um, very, very safe. Like it's uh, one of the safest, if not the safest means of energy production we have as a society. 
um, that that works at scale. But 40 years ago, or was it 50 uh, now, when Chernobyl happened, uh, it, it was still sort of in the early stage. And maybe we trusted this technology and how to handle it a little bit too much. Maybe we, we were a little bit um, too um, careless. We should have been more careful. Mm -hmm. yep. So, um, but, but today, uh, instead, there's this backlash in many countries where people, because of that accident, the catastrophe, are very skeptical, almost to the point of irrational. Mm -hmm. So that, that's just my opinion. And I, and I think this happens with technologies often where we suddenly accept some, we don't accept it, we don't accept it. And then we have this illusion of understanding like with nuclear and then we accept it suddenly. And then even then it's too early. And then there's something that goes wrong and everyone's very scared and it creates this backlash that's irrational for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, if you uh, if you think about when I, I, when you were talking about this, I was thinking about technologies that it happened for them also, mm -hmm. like e electricity. It happened when electricity <laughs> came in. People were really afraid of electrocution, really afraid. Yeah. But then at some point, when you look, I, I was checking some uh, newspapers from nineteen nineteen twenty or eighteen, like between eighteen like uh, ninety to nineteen twenty nice. something. They were like doing everything with electricity. So whenever you had problem, there was electricity. Like you have headache, they put electricity in your head. <laughs> they were, you have, they, they, they were making electric stuff that you shouldn't be, but they were yes. just there. But, and yes. the best example is the x-ray. I, I have, mm. I, I checked, I, I was thinking about when x-ray came, people were really afraid because you can see through people. That was really afraid of people. But then they start doing crazy stuff that one product that kind of stick out for me was uh, when you wanted to buy uh, shoes in between 1910, 1920 around, I think, maybe 1800 something. Uh, there was x-ray machine in, in the shoe shop. You put your shoes on and then you put your foot inside oh that device. God. They don't take a picture. They just look at it with a continuous x-ray. Oh my God. To see, does it fit or not? <laughs> oh so my they, God. And they had it for a long time until they figured out that, oh, <laughs> damn, the, the These people actually. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, that's a, that's a great example. Um, what, what this proves to me is the, the irrational acceptance is because of the prior irrational uh, rejection. So because there was an irrational way of fearing technology, X, whatever, X-rays, mm -hmm. nuclear, AI, because the rejection and the fear is based on irrationality, doesn't make any sense, right? So, so yes, there's fear because it's new, but it doesn't make sense. It's irrational. Because of that, once it switches to acceptance, the acceptance is also irrational. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So even so, the irrational irrationality just continues from from rejection to acceptance. And both are dangerous, or both are bad. It's very. It can be even dangerous to reject something because you don't understand it, and it can be equally or more dangerous to accept it because you don't understand. It. True. I mean. Uh... Have you heard the, what happened to Amazon? I, I read, I think last week. Uh, now, no. Amazon has a huge backlog of self-published authors because the author is actually using ChatGPT to generate the books now, <laughs> and they are much faster. So, and you can self-publish now Amazon, you know that, that you can self-publish. No, like, I didn't uh, know that. Oh, so basically you can write a book and you can pay Amazon and they publish, publish it. Yeah, just like self-published. You can have like so can, I can, 1, like, in, of them. in one week, I can probably produce like 10 books. titles. Yeah. Ten, yeah, 10 books. And, yeah. and I'll just put them out there with catchy titles and someone's going to buy them. Yeah, imagine so that all these fan people. fictions, you know, the, all the fan fictions, you can just write like, imagine that I can write now, uh, write a book in the style of Fifty Shades of Grey. And, but in the... No, I didn't. In, in the, in the language of Simpsons, <laughs> like imagine Simpsons about Fifty Shades of Grey, and it will be ready in like like 
at most you can pay the API money, not the free one, and then it will be ready in like three hours. Like ready, wow. you just put it there, out. So Amazon has a backlog now. Right now has a backlog of uh, publishing self-published books now. So people are, are like too much acceptance. Are they, are they trying to block books that are written by ChatGPT or no? I, I, mean, I mean, it's getting crazy. Things but, are getting but really they don't, crazy. They now. don't really have a... Like, why would they... It, like, why would they block that? Like, there's no reason. I mean, there's no reason. There's no, no reason, Brockett. There are some uh, groups in academia, I think. I heard that uh, in uh, uh, academic circles, they are, they're working on some models that detect that yeah, it yeah, is yeah. Ger generated by ChatGPT there is, or there not. Is a, there is a website. Uh, let me see if I can open it. Uh, so there's a website called... Uh, I think it's called right yeah so so yeah writer writer.com mm -hmm. writer as an author writer.com has an ai content detector sure so they have that one yeah but so yeah but even you, people you go there that, and you enter but people that they uh, that they're not supposed actually they are sanctioned it like for example uh there was uh what was the university that they apologized uh I think it was Duke University. I don't want to say name because it's, a, it's a, one of the universities, like top universities in the U.S. They apologized because they used uh, Chat GPT for, um, uh, I think, uh, consultation, student consultation, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> so, but imagine that they themselves probably, if if a student write uh, an, a, an essay using Chat GPT, they will like uh, they will give him F or something, but. But they also yeah. use it for consultation. So yeah, that's true. This thing. But crazy. I mean, I also, I also question, you know, um, should you give a student that uses ChatGPT an F? Um, it's not so clear to me. Um, well, I mean, honestly, with the quality of the uh, of the output, because. Logically, when you think about what is output of ChatGPT, the output of the ChatGPT is the average of whatever is outside in the internet. On, on uh, yeah, but it's not, it's not completely random. Like it, it is a coherent text. You can yeah, read yeah, it. It yeah. makes a lot of sense. Um, but then yeah, the, I, the grade I, will be C. The grade will be like average, like, a, like average, whatever average grade People, if if you sure. write an article about uh, sure, slavery, no. for example, it sure, will be. I'm not, yeah. I'm not. I'm not saying that the grade should be A, but I'm also not agreeing that the grade should automatically be F, because here's the thing. I mean, it depends on what the purpose is, of course. But um, unless you're writing for the sake of writing, meaning, let's say you're taking a, you, you're taking a class in order to become a writer. Actually, even then, you know what, even then, why are you trying to become a writer? Because you want to write books. Why are you trying to become, write books? Well, to impact people and everything has a purpose. We, we rarely, except for poetry. It has a even purpose poetry, too. Even, even, even poetry has a purpose. Everything has a purpose, right? If you accomplish the purpose, so, you know, the objective, let's put it mathematically. Like if you achieve your objective fun function, mm -hmm. which is invoke certain feeling in someone or get someone to pay you some amount of money or convince someone to vote for something or defend yourself correctly in court or um, anything, like every, every piece of content we produce, and it's typically text, has a purpose. If the purpose sorry, the objective is accomplished, who cares how I did it? Well, I mean, there are lots, there are lots of uh, caveat here. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's say, uh, what's the difference between uh, I write, um, I, give, I, I give the assignment to somebody else, he mm -hmm. writes it for me, mm -hmm. and I get it and then get it to the teacher and get the, I don't know, B or C. Mm -hmm. And I don't even mention that I didn't write it. Yeah, somebody else did it. And uh, what's the difference between no, no. that so, one and then yes. and then if the chat chat GBD does it? 
So, um, so here's the thing. If, if the assignment is that you have to write it, then yeah, that's a different thing. But if the yeah. assignment is write something, produce a text that does something, accomplishes objective X, then, uh, yeah, as long as I don't lie. So if the teacher or instructor asks me, uh, did you write this? And I tell the truth. No, chat GPT wrote it or my friend wrote it. Then, uh, no, I don't see a problem. Um, yeah, I do see a problem in that either. Like, for example, where is actually okay. It's like, uh, the way that I used it, you know, yeah. I want to write, uh, an article and teach people to learn certain skills. Yeah. Yeah. One of those skills that I want to teach them is a, is a kind of little bit involved. It means that I need to spend lots of time on that. But yeah. then the other ones are mechanical. There's something yeah. that like you can find it in the internet also in like uh, scattered around, but then, but if I tell chat GBT, you know, these three, three topics, you write it, this one topic, I will write it. I just put together, even if I don't mention that who wrote it at the end, yeah. Who cares? Who cares? At the end, it's, so uh, here's but the thing. then, uh, yeah. I mean, we often produce content of other kind where we don't mention all of the technologies we use. You don't yeah. mention every time you use a calculator, which calculator brand you used and, and what. Every time you use a piece of software to edit your videos, you don't mention that. Every time you, you know, uh, when you write equations, you use a software that can write the integral form and, and all these other things. You don't do it by hand. You don't do it manually. And even do if you do it by hand, you're using a pen. You have to mention which pen manufacturer because you didn't do create that pen yourself. Or as long paper. as exactly, but as long as your sole purpose was using that pen, like for example, if you are somebody who has to do a really nice, you have to do painting, and the people mm -hmm. try teach you. You go to school and you you take a class to teach you how to uh, paint with the particular device. Yeah. Yeah, and then that so, device becomes obsolete or. Yeah, yeah, you use that. You you have to use it in that class. But then when you get out of class and you want to go and then get a contract and then make some painting for somebody, you don't yeah. have to use that. You can use like a paintbrush, whatever. Yeah, or <laughs> so, you can you can use even uh, you know uh, Dolly or or Mid Journey. Sure. I mean, I was having this similar discussion with a friend of mine who's artistic. At you know, same applies for this visual arts and visual GANs, uh, generative models where. Look, uh, three, four hundred, five hundred years ago, a real painter mixed his own paint. Uh, some painters even produced their own brushes. Mm -hmm. And then eventually there were businesses and others who were focused on producing paint of various kinds of colors. There were others who were experts in producing the best brushes. So you as a painter, you just leverage this technology. You bought ready paint. You bought ready, perfect brushes, different kinds of brushes. You didn't produce your own brushes of certain forms and shapes. You bought it. And, mm -hmm. and, and eventually, you know, painters started to use Photoshop, uh, oh, sorry, paint shop. And they started to actually create that kind of art digitally using digital tools, still like clicking and stuff, but clicking, but Hey, every time they draw a line or a circle, they're not doing that manually. They're using the circle function or the linear line function, right? These are already technologies. So what is it? I mean, ultimately you are trying to accomplish an objective X. Yeah. The, any, it, any means uh, that is not harming someone is for me kosher. Sure. It's acceptable. Uh, well, there are, there are like two kind of thing I want to mention. Like what, one of them is that what I believe is that what AI is doing right now is that uh, bringing more people into fold. It mm -hmm. means that in any any kind of vertical that you look, like for example, one example that you mentioned was uh, at some point in maybe 50 years ago when you want to create music, you had to know how to play guitar. Uh, you had to have a studio. You had to bring all these people <clears> that play another instruments, uh, other mm. instruments, and just like put together a studio and then just practice, practice and learn. Now you have a, like a, in a simple case, you have this 
GarageBand that you have in the in the MacBook, or you have like the softwares that like one person just just sitting and then play and then put together everything, and then one person can like create a whole al this this album. Now we have AIs that they can yeah. create musics. Now what is it? What how people come into fold is that there are people that they have ideas in their head, but they yes. don't they don't have they didn't have the uh, chance to learn the technique. Same yeah. same goes with te painting and all these other things exactly. we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, there are many more painters today than there were 400 years ago. Many more. Yeah. But percentage if, wise, also. Just imagine that what we did so far before Chat GPT and probably next generation of that. Uh, people who were uh, dyslexic, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we completely put them away. I mean, we just like uh, uh, prevent them from entering writing books. Although there are many of them, probably that not many of them, but there's there's a good percentage of them that have creative minds. They yeah. they have ideas in their head that it would be really interesting to hear. But yeah. just because they cannot write, the immediate people around exactly. them, like like when you talk to people, I mean, like because I I talk to like a stand-up comedian a lot around. Like when I, when, I, when I kind of meet them, many of them actually they are actually they are dyslexic, and they say that the reason that they didn't become writers, but they become uh, stand -up. Uh, like stand-up comedian because stand-up comedian you don't have to write. Yeah, so they become a stand-up comedian, it. and then yeah. they, the audience that they have is kind of limited compared to writer. But now probably they have this idea, they have this plot line in their head. That they can put in words, and then somebody else can help them, like a wow. like a chat GPT. That's, that's like a, that's what I'm saying. That the, um, this technology AI, machine learning, kind of helps uh, more people that, for some reason, they couldn't come into that vertical. Now they can, and that's a good thing, I think. And and look, uh, this is an excellent way of looking at it. I I really like how you put that because. The same applies for non-creative fields as well. Anything really, any field that requires special skills or special expertise is becoming more and more accessible thanks to AI. Take, yeah. take medicine. Like uh, eventually this technology will reach a point where an average person can be a physician in the sense that an average person can have certain objectives. Oh, I want to... I want to help my daughter or my, my son who's sick and they don't need a human expert or they don't need to go and consult with someone who has those expert skills. Just like, oh, I want to paint an amazing painting for my wife. You don't need to go and uh, take painting classes. You don't need to go and pay a painter, professional painter to paint that painting. You can, with the right technology tools, create that achieve that objective yourself, whether it's healing your son who's sick or painting an amazing painting for your wife. So in a way, I think AI is democratizing special skills in mm -hmm. the sense that it's making it less special. Um, That's, true. That's true. And, 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 and the special thing becomes this inner, now we're getting really philosophical, the inner drive whether it's for creativity, problem solving, solution finding, whatever it is, mm -hmm. your motivation and your objective as a human being, that's what, what will differentiate people from people, not the skills. Because eventually, and maybe this is 100 years from now, or maybe it's 50 years from now, or maybe it's 20 years from now, but eventually we'll reach a point where every human can do anything every other human can do. The question is, but this superpower, God, God like power, because every human will be like God. Imagine like all of the professions of the earth just put into one human and every human is like that. What do you do with it? You have the power of God. We all do. What do each of us do with that? That will be what's differentiating and what defines different people. Yeah. What to do with the power. That's a, that's the important part. Yeah. Okay. Good. Hello. Uh, now, let's just uh, come back to Earth now. Rossi, man, Farad, just as a, but yeah, to be, be surprised already about. 
uh, okay. wrap up maybe, uh, like maybe like ten, in 10 minutes okay okay, okay. so no so just uh, because i just want to give uh, uh the audience and the viewers also uh some of your mind that they, they use it so um uh, if somebody wants to go and let's say somebody right now is doing uh, some boot camp in data science or learn mm -hmm. some general stuff data science and if they want to get into market enter the market in the next year or so what do you suggest what what is it that what kind of skills do you think uh, as a, imagine that you are a, you're you're just a, uh, you're a director you're a vp there so you are hiring I mean, imagine yeah. i am who i am <laughs> Imagine you are who you are, and and uh, one year from now, one of these people that are listening to you right now, or or the viewers, apply for uh, the apply the job. What do you look into them? What, mm. what I mean, what do you look uh, look for mm. uh, in in their skills? Mm. Um, there's two ways of answering that. Mm, I'm going to answer it in both ways. Um, one way is um, in the immediate short term, the way you put the question, which is, you know, if I'm just l looking to get this job, what, how do I get past? And, and I can tell you exactly what I look for. The second way of answering it is in the bigger picture, not just looking at Bobak and who's Bobak hiring or who someone other, some other VP or director is hiring, but what is useful skill set for me in general in this future that AI uh, or machine learning is, is creating for us the future society, the future job environment. I'll answer it in the first question, in the first version first. Uh, look, Kheli saw this. It's, it's very, very simple. I uh, look at your technical skills and your, um, what I would call soft skills or communication, social, type of skills. Um, uh, and, and technical skills for me is more than just um, the craft of it. it. It's more than just, for instance, being able to be a decent Python programmer, uh, have a, a fluency in using developer tools from, of course, uh, version management tools for, for um, code as well as data, as well as models. So there's uh, this whole paradigm of uh, ML ops or, or um, just ops. I, I, I think ML ops and DevOps are, are merging and should merge. It, it should become the same thing. Um, but anyway, so, so it's more than just those type of skill sets and of course being familiar with uh, the major popular machine learning libraries and toolkits like, like TensorFlow or Keras if you're a Python user and, uh, and uh, have a thorough good understanding for the mathematics behind it. Not everyone needs to be a uh, you know, PhD level understanding of the mathematics, but you should have a good solid understanding of the basics. That, I, just, I don't just look for that when I look for technical skills. I also look at how you problem solve. You know, are you a good problem solver? And that's, that can be a difficult thing to, to define or specify. But in short, um, you, know, you have to be good at cracking puzzles, solving generic type of problems. I, in my interviews, I typically ask people to solve a problem that has nothing to do with machine learning or coding or, or even mathematics. It's just a puzzle, like a fun type of puzzle you would get in a, mm. in a Mehmuni. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I sort of look for that, uh, you know, are they good problem solver? That for me is part of technical skills. Uh, yep. It requires analytical thinking, but also other types of, um, 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 let's call it interdisciplinary type of thinking. Uh, and then, uh, as I said, I also look at soft skills. Um, and soft skills for me are, are you know, um, all, everything that's non-technical, <laughs> basically interpersonal skills, how you relate and build relationships with other people, because you're going to work in a team. You're not going to be an isolated. 
in a company, you're going to work with others. So you have to be a good communicator. You have to be good at establishing relationships that are professional and, and productive, uh, as well as cordial with other people. Um, uh, you have to be able to, for instance, explain and communicate uh, complicated topics to non-technical people, people that are non-experts. Uh, mm -hmm. That happens often in companies. Um, yeah, so so I, I look at that and, and um, I look at the combination of those things. I can go deeper in both of those uh, categories of skills I look for, but that's what I look for when I yeah. um, hire. So that's the first version of the answer. Should I give the second version? Yeah, before you get it, I, yeah. I have this uh, this idea that if it was uh, financially feasible, uh, the best way of recruiting people, particularly for uh, soft skill, is that if you can gather all the candidates and go for a like two days camping trip. That's a, that's the kind of the best way of recruiting because nobody I, can hide for two days stuff. I love that. So yeah, you you easily understand like who actually wash the dishes, who yeah. like when when they like do stuff they put it back. Who is who freaks out when something goes wrong? You no, know? you can. I, easily, I like, love that. In fact, uh, I'm going to steal that idea from you. Next yeah, time, next time it. for a position when there's more than one eligible candidate. And let's say there's N candidates, but I can only hire like yeah. a subset of them. I would probably do something like that. That's a great and you can And you can just start with that. Okay, so like you're, you're four of them. We want to hire one person. In the camping trip, we hire one person. We eat the last three. <laughs> 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 I like that. We, and we don't have food. <laughs> and we don't have food. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's the, the problem food. solving uh, <laughs> that you have to do. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I like that. Okay, so like second that. version. So second version of the answer is a bit broader. It's not just looking at who Bobak hires or someone else hires. It's looking at what type of skills or way of thinking should I cultivate and improve in myself to have a future in this industry, in this very mm -hmm. fast moving and fast changing industry. And I would say, here, it's important not to focus on any specific type of technical skills, like any specific type of programming language or any specific type of even, even um, you know, libraries or, or paradigms like deep learning. I mean, deep learning is, is less than 10 years old or about 10 years old. Like, uh, you don't know, you and I and no one knows if 10 years from now, it's not going to be replaced with a completely different paradigm, right? Uh, so any type of technological tool or, or, um, uh, uh, crafts that you have techniques are eventually going to be outdated. So what's more important, I think, to, to establish and, and cultivate is some of the more fundamental things that enables you to tackle any new paradigm should look like when I was doing my PhD, even though I use neural networks in my PhD and in my dissertation, uh, deep learning wasn't a thing. You know, Jeffrey Hinton's famous paper hadn't come out and, and all of this work that happened hadn't happened. Um, but the way I've remain, remained in the industry and I'm working with the cutting edge, high, high technology in the space as, as it has evolved is I focused on the fundamentals behind this. The fundamentals had to, has to do actually with pretty basic stuff, such as a, a very solid understanding of mathematics and principles of mathematics uh, that underlie um, computer science in general, you know, not just deep learning. Um, it also, even, even maybe you could say prior to that, requires a uh, a scientific mindset. And when I say scientific, I'm, I'm being very specific. For me, scientific uh, mindset uh, pertains to the scientific methodology. The approach to uh, hypothesize, to create a hypothesis that may explain some thing you're observing, data you're observing, uh, test it empirically, 
establish, accept or reject the hypothesis, and then iterate. That is the scientific methodology um, summarized. So uh, you have to have that kind of mindset in everything you do. Um, and, and that should be your approach to any kind of learning or self-development you have. If you have that and at least some mathematical thinking, you don't have to be an expert at mathematics, but some mathematical thinking, structured, uh, following some sort of formalism. It, again, doesn't have to be mathematics, but it has to be a mathematical thinking with, with uh, some, some rule-based or, or formalism. Um, and, 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 and then you have curiosity, like endless curiosity. Those things will take care of you no matter what's going to happen tomorrow. People talk about singularity and AI will take over, robots will take over. Fine, that, that may happen um, and the world will probably be even more crazy different for us when we're old than it is currently for our parents. Because it, sometimes, you know, I sit and think about how the world has changed for, for our parents' generation. And it's insane to even think about like from when they were born to what we have today with AI yep. and yep. Like these, these devices where you can watch endless amount of movies and talk to anyone in the world. And, and you have this thing with you wherever you go. And, and uh, I mean, self-driving cars and, and, you know, yeah. uh, spaceships that, uh, that can uh, fly close to the sun. Like it's a very, very crazy world compared to when they were born almost mind bending. It will probably be even more crazy for us in the world, even more oh, yeah. bigger gap than it is for them. So exactly. how do you, how do you adjust or adapt to this kind of world? Well, with those basics that I said, I think mm. scientific method, method thinking, um, curiosity and some sort of structure in your, in our thinking that helps you yeah. structure whatever you're tackling. Yeah, and uh, just uh, just a final thing that I I, I want to say is that um, the way that I think about this advancement of AI is um, uh, AI right now this advancement like LLM like generative uh, um, kind of uh, these images that they have with the dolly and stuff mm -hmm. it's like a huge boulder that kind of a smash through a, like a huge barrier that we had. And lots of scraps is around now that you can basically each of them is a tool now like yep. for like, like imagine that uh, you couldn't do many things, but now this, uh, because some people, there's this tendency that, okay, so like, but when, when you talk to especially younger people, they say, okay, so if you want to build the LLM now, uh, it's a, if you have to have a 90 billion, uh, parameters on it and uh, you need to have like 5,000 GPUs running for six months to be able to train it and it costs like, a, like imagine OpenAI raised like a billion dollar for that. Yeah. You know? How can I compete with that? But then uh, the way that I think about it is that what they did actually they made this huge boulder to smash it through this barrier. Yeah. Now like, like tools are everywhere now. Now you can just take that and make stuff that you couldn't do before. You can make before. Like the simple thing is that, like, the, as I said, the way that I use it, which is kind of really primitive. Yeah. I'm pretty sure as we go, uh, people find out ways to put things together, all these scraps, and make things, like make applications. That, like, that's the kind of exciting thing for me. It means like using this phenomenon that ha that's happening I, I want to ask you the one last question at the end. At the end, um, I want to ask you about that. That we had uh, generative this image a couple of months ago because now it's just a couple of months. It's just not. Yeah, I cannot even it's... ask you what do you what do you think five years from now. No, no, a couple no. of months ago, it was like generative image came out. People try to use it in application. Some people use it. Probably they are is still trying to, and maybe we'll see next year some really interesting kind of companies come out of that using these kind of uh, generative uh, these images. Now it's LLM, large language model, people going nuts over like using it to, uh, to build products. What do you think in, in six months, uh, the next, next thing, 
next wave. So Just I guess. think, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have, uh, I have two guesses. Well, uh, besides the obvious, uh, which is video, I think there's going to mm -hmm. be uh, a mind blowing video generation where basically you can give it the script of a movie or a video clip sure. and it will generate it as, as accurate as it can. Uh, besides those kind of obvious, and of course, GPT-4 being more uh, more mind-blowing and more accurate, not making a lot of the stupid things, errors GPT-3 does. Um, but besides that, the bigger thing, I think, six months, maybe to a year from now, is we would start seeing a paradigm shift in, 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 in software industry in general, where we will move from software as a way of solving problems because software and writing software code, Andre Karpati talks uh, about this a lot. I heard uh, about it. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he talks about I think called software 2.0 or whatever S software as a way of writing code, uh, software writing s software code as a way of solving problems is a very inefficient way and, mm -hmm. and prone to errors. Tons of errors. Cause even after you've written a piece of software, you don't know if it actually solved the problem. You discover it. I mean, unless you have covered all of the test cases, infinite <laughs> test cases that exist, you will just discover if it's actually solving a problem. Yeah. Um, so software is a very inefficient way of solving most problems. So for most problems, I think we will jump directly to solution with a, a deep learning based type of model, like a generative model, instead of actually writing pieces of software that solve problems for us. So like yeah. take, actually, he take, said. Yeah, his sentence was that uh, they asked him that what is the uh, what is the uh, programming language of tomorrow, and he said English. That was a, that was yeah. his answer. He said that the yeah. program language of tomorrow, and when he say tomorrow, honestly, <laughs> I'm thinking it's just maybe it's tomorrow. <laughs> I don't know because I actually think there will be in the next yeah, year one day we will tomorrow. wake up and will literally be tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, because when it, when ChatGPT came, it was just like that. Literally, I was sleeping. Wake, I, I woke up the next day, and OpenAI was out. They said we had ChatGPT. You could try it. And I said, God damn it! Just yeah. like they did it. Just and like right that, yeah. before that, like before that, it was like birds and stuff. Yeah, which was it, it, kind it, of funny. I mean, yeah. when, when they were dude, people make fun of that, mm -hmm. and from people make fun of things to the actually. Suddenly... Going, start using it. It's just oh, like, wow. it was one day. Yeah. 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 True. That's true. Uh, really can great. I, can I say one last thing? Um, sure. I, I, mentioning Andre Karpati uh, reminded me of something. I, I, I don't know what the average age of your listeners are, but let's just say if I was, um, I don't want to say young, but if I was at a stage in my life where I had lots of time, on my hands and I could like start something new uh, from scratch. Let's say if I was in my early twenties today, I would first of all, go and do a boot camp. If I, if I didn't already have the background I have, but if when I was 20, I didn't have this background. I hadn't even finished my masters, but I would go and do a boot camp uh, in this space. There's so many good ones out there in data science, machine learning. Um, after that, getting su prof sufficiently proficient in, in machine learning and, and some of the modern techniques, I would go and spend, I don't know how many months it will take, but enough time by myself to go through all of Andre Karpati's videos on YouTube. He has excellent videos where he, he's a phenomenal instructor and teacher where he just walks you through literally, you know, it's two, three hour videos, each of them. Uh, different chapters where he basically walks you through from the basics to the most advanced builds everything with you. So the idea is that you sit and, and you code while you're watching these videos, he codes as well. So you, you basically mimic him, ape him, and you learn from that and from what he's explaining, just go through all of his material, learn that. And then after that, you go and apply for a job at open AI or some similar company, or even start your own, because after that you will be immensely, I would be immensely uh, empowered to actually do something very relevant in this space today. That's Great. what I would do. And that's what I would recommend to someone who's young. Okay. So now you know what to do. 
<laughs> I'm <laughs> exactly. not talking to you. I'm talking to the viewer now. <laughs> yes. Great. Yeah. Uh, that was a really nice way to end uh, the, the, pod, the, pod, the podcast. And uh, thank you for giving me your time and uh, talking to our viewers and listeners. Um, uh, You're welcome. Again, again, th again, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much.